Well, hello. Fancy seeing you again. Hey, let's have a little bit more of Ronya the Robber's Daughter, written by Astrid Lindgren. If you remember, last night, uh, not Astrid, that's the author, Ronya was attacked, wasn't she, in the fog? <gasps> Terrifying moment. But Burke was there and protected her. I love a good friendship. Oh, she was a bit of a of a tough cookie, though, isn't she, really? She's a bit of a, a tough... I can't talk tonight. Doesn't bode well. A tough nut to crack because she was still a little bit cold with him, wasn't she? So hopefully tonight she'll warm to him. We'll have a go, shall we? Part five. Here we go. <laughs> that evening, Ronya sat in front of the fire with her father for a time, and then she remembered what it was she wanted to know. Father, what is it that you have been taking without asking? As Borka said. Hmm, said Mattis. Uh, I was so afraid you would not find her way home in the fog, my Ronya. But I did, Ronya said. Listen, what is it that you have taken without asking? Look there, said Mattis pointing excitedly into the fire. Don't you see? It looks just like an old man. It looks like Borka. How horrid. But Ronya could see no sign of Borka in the fire, and she wasn't the least bit interested. What was it you have taken without asking? She insisted. When Mattis did not answer, Noddle Pete answered for him. A lot of things. Oh, lots of things. I reckon it's about... Stop that, Mattis said angrily. I'll deal with this myself. All the robbers except Noddle Pete had already gone to their rooms. Lovis was out settling her chickens and goats and sheep for the night. So it was only Noddle Pete who heard Mattis explain to Ronya what a robber really was. A person who took things without asking and without permission. Mattis had no need to be ashamed of that. On the contrary, he usually blustered and bragged that he was the greatest robber chieftain in all the woods and mountains. But it was a little harder now that he had to tell Ronya about it. Of course, he had intended to tell her about it sooner or later when it was necessary, but he had wanted to wait a little. Little innocent child that you are, my Ronya. That is why I haven't talked much about it before. No, you have not ever said a word, Noddle Pete assured him. And we weren't allowed to say anything either. Old man, isn't it about time you went to bed? Said Mattis, but Noddle Pete said it wasn't. He wanted to hear this. And Ronya understood. Now at last she understood where everything came from. All the things the robbers had on their horses' backs when they came riding home in the evening. All the goods in sacks and bundles. All the precious things in chests and boxes. They didn't grow on trees in the forest. Her father simply took them from other people. But don't they get terribly angry when you take their things away from them? Asked Ronya. Noddle Pete sniggered. Angry fit to burst! He assured her, Oh dear, oh dear, you should just hear them. Old man, it would be a good thing if you finally went to bed now, said Mattis. But Noddle Pete still wouldn't go. Some of them, <laughs> some of them even cry, he told Ronya. Then Mattis roared, Now be quiet, otherwise I will throw you out. He patted Ronya's cheek. You've just got to understand, Ronya. That's the way it is. That's the way it has always been. It's nothing to make a fuss about. No, it isn't, said Noddle Pete. But people never do get used to things. They go on howling and crying and swearing till it's a pleasure to hear. Mattis gave him an angry glare. Then he turned back to Ronya. My father was a robber chief, and so was my grandfather, and my great-grandfather, as you know. I haven't let them down. I am a robber chieftain too, the mightiest in all the woods and mountains. That is what you are going to be too, Ronya mine. Me? shouted Ronya. 
Never! Not if they get angry and cry. Mattis scratched his head. He was worried now. He wanted Ronya to admire and love him as much as he loved and admired her. And here she was shouting never and refusing to be a robber chief. That made Mattis unhappy. He must find a way to get her to believe that what he was doing was right and good. You, you see, Ronya darling, I only take from the rich, he protested. Then he thought for a moment. And I give to the poor. I really do. Noddle Pete sniggered. Oh, oh my goodness, yes, that's true enough. You gave that poor widow with the eight children a whole sack of flour, do you remember? Quite so, said Mattis. I did indeed. He stroked his black beard with satisfaction. He was very pleased now, both with himself and with Noddle Pete. Noddle Pete sniggered again. You have a good memory, you have, Mattis. Let's see. That must have been, what, ten years ago. Oh, yes, of course you give to the poor. Every ten years, give or take a year. Then Mattis roared, If you don't go to bed now, I know someone who's going to help you get there. But it was not necessary, because at that moment, Lovis came in and Noddle Pete went off without assistance. Ronya went to bed and the fire died as Lovis sang the wolf song. And Ronya lay there listening and not bothering whether her father was a robber chieftain or not. He was her Mattis. Whatever he did, she loved him. That night she slept badly and dreamed of the unearthly ones with their enticing song, but she'd forgotten all about them when she woke up. What she remembered was Burke. In the days that followed, she sometimes thought of him and wondered how he was getting on over in Borker's Keep and how long it would be before Mattis finally drove his father and their whole robber tribe out of his fort. Mattis was drawing up great new plans for action every day, but none of them was much good. It's no use, said Noddle Pete, no matter what Mattis thought of. You'll have to be as cunning as a fox, because force won't work. It didn't suit Mattis to be cunning as a fox, but he did his best. And while this was going on, not much robbery took place. The Borka robbers had other things to think about too. And the people who had to pass through the robbers' walk in those days were surprised at how free from robbers it was. They couldn't understand why it was so peaceful. Where had all the highwaymen gone? The sheriff's men, who had hunted Borka so persistently, found the cave where his robber's den had been, but it was deserted now and empty of loot. There was no sign of Borker, and the soldiers were glad to be able to leave Borker's wood at last, dark and cold and rainy as it was now that the autumn had come. Of course they knew there were robbers far away in Mattis Forest as well, but they preferred not to think about that. There was no worse place, and the robber chieftain lived there was harder to catch than an eagle on a cliff top. They would rather leave him in peace. Mattis spent most of his time trying to work out what the Borka robbers were up to over in the North Fort and that what would be the best way to get at them, so he went out scouting every day. With one or two of his men, he rode to the wood on the north side, but there was no sign of the invaders. For the most part, it was as silent and dead as if there was no Borka robbers there whatsoever. But they had made themselves a fine long rope ladder so they could get up and down the rock face without difficulty. Mattis saw it being lowered only once. He lost his head completely and rushed forward like a madman to clamber up it. His robbers followed him, burning with lust for battle. But a shower of arrows came down from the loopholes of Borker's Keep and Little Snip got one in the thigh that kept him in bed for two days. Obviously the rope ladder was lowered only under strict guard. The autumn clouds now hung heavily over Mattis' fort, and the robbers were not enjoying their inactivity. They became restless and squabbled more than usual, and Lovis could stand it no longer. You'll burst my eardrum soon with all your wrangling and nagging. You can all go to Hell's Gap if you don't hold your peace. They fell silent, and Lovis set them to useful work clearing out and cleaning the hen house and the sheep fold and the goat stall, all of which they heartily disliked. But no one got out of it except Noddle Pete and those who happened to be on guard at the Wolf's Neck and up at Hell's Gap. Mattis also did his best to keep the robbers going. 
He took them on elk hunts, setting out with spears and bows in the autumn woods, and Noddle Pete smiled contentedly when they returned, dragging four big elk carcasses behind them. Chicken soup and mutton soup and porridge don't serve a man long, he said. Now we'll have something to chew on, and the tenderest bits go to the toothless, as everyone knows. Lovis roasted elk meat and smoked elk meat and salted down elk meat for the winter to supplement the roast chicken and legs of mutton. <coughs> Excuse me. Ronya spent her time in the woods as usual. It was very quiet there now, but she thought even the autumn woods were good to wander in. The moss was soft and green and damp under her bare feet. The smell of autumn was wonderful and the branches of the trees glistened with moisture. It often rained and she liked to sit hunched under a thick fir tree listening to the gentle pattering outside. Sometimes it poured down until the whole wood was running with rain and she liked that too. There were not many animals to be seen. Her foxes stayed in their dens, but sometimes in the dusk she saw elk come trotting by and sometimes wild horses grazing among the trees. She longed to catch a wild horse for herself and she had often tried but without success. The wild horses were very shy and would certainly be hard to tame, but it was the time she had a horse, and she told Mass so as well. Yes, when you're strong enough to catch one yourself, you may have one, he had replied. And one day I shall, she thought. I'll catch a lovely little one and I'll take it home to Mattis Fort and tame it the way Mattis did with all of his horses. Otherwise the autumn woods were strangely deserted. All the creatures which were usually there had vanished. They'd probably crept into their holes and hide in places. Sometimes, though, quite re rarely, harpies came swooping down from the mountains. But they were calmer now and mostly stayed up in their mountain retreats. The grey dwarfs kept away as well. Just once, Ronya saw one or two of them peeping out from behind a stone. But she no longer felt frightened of grey dwarfs. Go to hell's gap, she shouted and they ran off with hoarse hissing sounds. Burke never appeared in her woods, and of course she was glad of that. Or was she? Sometimes she wasn't quite sure how she felt. Then winter came, snow fell, the air grew cold, and the hoarfrost transformed Ronya's forest into an ice forest, more beautiful than she could have imagined. She went skiing there, and when she turned to go home at twilight, she had frost in her hair and frozen toes and fingers in spite of her leather gloves and boots. But neither snow nor cold could keep her away from the forest. The next day she was there again. Mattis was sometimes worried when he saw her rushing off down the slopes toward the wolf's neck, and he said to Lovis, as he had so often said before, I hope everything is all right. I hope nothing awful happens to her. I couldn't live if it did. What are you moaning about? said Lovis. That child can take care of herself better than any robber. How often do I have to tell you this? And of course, Ronya could take care of herself. But one day, something happened, which it was just as well Mattis did not know about. More snow had fallen in the night and covered up all of Ronya's ski tracks. She would have to make new ones, and it was hard work. The cold had already laid a thin coating of ice over the snow, but it was not strong enough. She kept on breaking through it, and finally she could make no more tracks. She wanted to go home. She had made her way up to a knoll and was going to shoot down the other side. It was a sheer drop, but she raced off fearlessly, the snow rising in clouds around her. There was a sudden dip in the ground, and she flew over it. But in her flight, she lost one of her skis, and when she landed, her foot broke through the snow into a deep hole. She saw her ski disappear down a slope, while she herself was stuck in the hole up to her knees. It made her laugh first, but she soon stopped laughing when she realised how bad things were. She couldn't free herself, no matter how hard she pulled and tugged. She could hear a murmur from the hole and could not think at first what was making it. But it wasn't long before she saw a party of rum fobs toiling up through the snow a little way off. They were easily recognisable by their broad rumps and wrinkled little faces and scrubby hair. On the whole, rum fobs were friendly and peaceable and did no harm, but these, staring at her with their simple eyes, were obviously annoyed. They grunted and sighed and one of them said morosely, What for did and want do that? 
and soon the others were joining in. Waffer did undo that. Broke roof. Waffer did on. Ronya realised that she'd stuck her foot into their underground hole. The rum fobs made these holes for themselves and they couldn't find a nice rotten tree to live in. I couldn't help it, she said. Help me get my leg out. But the rum fobs just stared at her and sighed as morosely as before. Unstuck in the roof. Waffer did undo it. Ronya was growing impatient. Help me then and I'll go away. But it was as if they didn't hear or understand. They just stared blankly at her and ran quickly back to their hole. She could hear their irritable muttering down there, but suddenly they began to shriek and howl as if they were pleased about something. She do go, they shrieked. She do swing there, she go. And Ronya could feel something hanging from her foot. Something heavy. Little boy, we hang good there, shrieked the rumfobs. Sion's cradle, we none have nasty old foot and roof. But Ronya had no desire to lie in the cold and snow, holding up the cradle for some stupid rumfobs. She tried again. She tugged and jerked as hard as she could to free herself, and the rumfobs cheered. Little boy, he be rocking. Fine, see? You must not be frightened in Mattis Forest. They'd been telling her that since she was small, and she had tried to arm herself against fear but sometimes it was no good. Just now, it was no good. What if she couldn't get free? What if she lay here and froze to death this very night? She, there was, she saw the dark snow clouds over the forest. There was more snow coming, and lots of it. Perhaps she would lie hidden underneath it, dead and frozen stiff, rocking a little rum fob on her dangling foot till springtime. Not till then would Mattis be able to come and find his poor little daughter who had frozen to death in the wintry forest. Oh no, she yelled. Help! Come and help me! But who was there to hear her in these empty woods? Not a soul. She knew that, but she went on shouting till she could shout no longer. And then she heard the rum fobs grumbling again. Un's been and stopped rocking now. What for did un? Then Ronya heard them no more, for she had seen the wild harpy. Like a beautiful great black bird of prey, the harpy came swooping across the forest, high up under the dark clouds, then dropped down and came in closer. Straight towards Ronya she flew, and Ronya closed her eyes. Nothing could save her now, she knew. Screeching and cackling, the harpy landed beside her. Pretty little human! She screamed shrilly, pulling at Ronya's hair. Just taking a little rest. Oh. <laughs> she cackled again, and it was the most horrid sound. You'll have to work for us, up in the mountains, till the blood runs, or else we'll scratch you, or else we'll claw you. The harpy began to tear and slash at Ronya with her sharp claws, and when Ronya lay motionless, she flew into a rage. Do you want me to scratch and claw? She bent over Ronya, her stony black eyes gleaming wickedly. Then she made another effort to get Ronya free, but no matter how she tugged and tore, it was no use, and in the end she tired of it. Then I'll go and fetch my sisters, she screamed. We'll get you tomorrow. You'll never take another rest here. Never, never. And off she flew over the treetops and disappeared towards the mountain peaks. Tomorrow, when the wild harpies come, there will be nothing here but a lump of ice thought Ronya. There was silence now down in a rum fob's hole. The whole forest was silent, waiting for night. Ronya was not waiting for anything else herself. She lay still. She'd given up struggling. It would come now, she thought, the last cold, dark, lonely night which was going to put an end to her. The snow began to fall and big flakes settled softly on her face. They melted there and mixed with her tears, for she was crying now. She was thinking of Mattis and Lovis. She would never see them again. No one would ever be happy again in Mattis' fort. Poor Mattis. He'd lose his senses with sorrow. And there would be no Ronya there to comfort him as she used to do when he was sad. No, there was no comfort to be given now, and none to be had. None at all. Then she heard someone speak in her name. She heard it clearly and distinctly, but she knew that it must be a dream and that made her cry again. Never more except in dreams would anyone call her by name, and soon she wouldn't even dream anymore. But then she heard the voice again. 
Ronya, shouldn't you go home now? She opened her eyes reluctantly, and there stood Burke. Yeah, Burke, on his skis. I found your ski down at the bottom, and was pure luck, because otherwise you'd gone on laying here. He put the ski down on the snow beside her. Do you need help? Then she was crying in earnest, so loudly and so desperately that she was ashamed. She was crying so hard that she couldn't answer him, but when he bent down to lift her up, she flung her arms around him and muttered frenziedly, Don't leave me! Don't, don't ever leave me again! That made him smile. No, as long as you keep our rope's length away. Now, let go of me and stop howling, and I'll see if I can get you free. He took off his skis, lay down beside her, and thrust his hand as far as he could into the hole. And when he had worked at it for a long time, the miracle happened. Ronya could pull her leg up. She was free. But the rumfobs in the hole were angry, and their little one whimpered. Walk a little boy up, and he got dirt in his eyes. What for did I do it? Ronya cried. She couldn't stop herself. Burke handed her the ski. Stop howling, he said. Otherwise, you're never going to get home. Ronya drew a deep breath. Yes, the crying was over now. She got to her feet and she tested her leg to see if it would hold her. I've got to try, she said. And you'll come too, won't you? I'll come too, said Burke. Ronya set off and made the run down the slope and Burke followed her. All the time, she, as, the, as she skied painfully homewards in the swirling snow, she had him behind her. Time and again she had to make sure that he was still there. She was so frightened that he might suddenly disappear and leave her on her own, but he was following her a rope's length away until they were nearly at the wolf's neck. There they had to part. From there, Burke would take a secret way back to Borker's keep. They stood silently for a time in the falling snow, trying to say goodbye. It was difficult, Ronnie felt, and she wanted with all her strength to keep him there. Listen, Burke, she said. I wish you were my brother. Burke laughed. <laughs> Why shouldn't I be, if you like? Robber's daughter? Hey? I do like, she said. But only if you call me Ronya. Ronya, sister mine, said Burke. And then he was gone in the well in snow. Oh, that's cute, isn't it? Brother and sister. Anyway. There we go. So that was another little bit, big bit tonight. Look, 22 minutes of reading. A bit of Ronya's the Robber's, Ronya the Robber's daughter. So today is, what is it for me? It's Tuesday for me today. Uh, the <gasps> Lion's Gate Day, 8th of the 8th. So, um, yeah, I'll be here again tomorrow. Got to pop into work tomorrow. That'll be something to do, won't it? I cut the lawn again today. Yesterday, I didn't cut it short enough. And there was lots of cut grass just laying around so i redid it today it looks much better out there today i must say gosh uh what else have i been up to today uh Bo has had one of his friends around today so that was noisy i just i hid up here out the way get right up well out of the way of them uh i think that's about all of the excitement that i've had today <laughs> gonna go and take the dog out for a walk now here you go see i told you i live a rock and roll life you don't know, do you? Uh, do you want a weather update? Yeah? Okay. I'm, I'm going to pull the curtain back in a dramatic fashion. <laughs> I don't even know if you can see out there. Can you see out there? There's my, there's my bottle of bottle of water. Can, I don't know. I don't think you can see. But it's pretty sunny out there today. Look, it's nice. I told you, the weather is finally coming here. I'm going to have a look on the weather app to see what it is. Uh... Currently, out there is 19 degrees centigrade, uh, Celsius. So, what's that? Double it. So, it's, what, 38? And add 30, 68 degrees Fahrenheit out there. So, um, you know, not quite Texas, is it? <laughs> all right. Okay. I'll see you all again tomorrow, I hope. Bye.